all accidents and safety standards. A rehabilitation centre was purpose built in Cooma to treat the snowy workers injured on the job. And seat belts became another first when Commissioner Hudson made it illegal for workers to drive on the job without a belt. By the time the Duke of Edinburgh came in 1956, the scheme had become an Australian success story. November 1956, the Duke of Edinburgh threw a switch, bringing down the first of many thousand tonnes of concrete, which will form a barrier 300 feet high. And that all-conquering Aussie spirit was shown once again when the Duke went out trout fishing with snowy officials. The Monero is renowned for its flies, sheep flies, so uh, we got the workmen to spray the trees, all the gum trees, with DDT. The first thing the Duke said when he got out of the car we hadn't realised, he looked up and he said, what's happened to the bloody gum trees? And they're all drooping. <laughs> the Duke's democratic tastes were well known to the snowy authorities. He could have been offended by the accommodation set up on the scheme, where railway tracks separated labourers' barracks from white-collar houses. So another small adjustment took place. Well, when the Duke of Edinburgh visited the Snowy, he had a plan of the works, and there was a wages area and a staff area, and he was going to inspect these places, so we were asked to rub out wages and staff so that he would think that it was just one um, big organisation and it was very democratic and people just lived anywhere. Give me a man who's a man among men his white collar and put down his pen we'll blow down a mountain and build you a dam bigger and better than old uncle sam roll, roll, roll on your way Snowy river roll on your way the official films made a display of hard-working obedient and monolithic workforce don't bring your sweetheart and don't bring your wife for here you must follow the bachelor life. When woman is woman, a man is a fool. You get much more work from a bow-legged mule. Oh, but behind the wholesome facade, there were other stories. You had some people there who had been for an awful long time, you know, for about 13 years, earning the equivalent of what, what is today a thousand bucks a week, and yet they had nothing because they got trapped into a cycle of gambling and drinking, and many of them were, were staggeringly drunk the night before, and somehow crawled back to work in the trench or in the tunnel uh, the following day, and I couldn't, um, I just had no idea how they kept alive. But gradually the scheme's greatest achievement came to the fore. The spirit of the Snowy family had no precedent. 100,000 people from 30 countries worked in harmony, with not a single report of a major trouble in all the years of construction. Well, they were model citizens, you know. Uh, of course there was a few push and shoves, you know. I mean, you know, you would think there's something wrong if that didn't happen, you know, and a few things that I might have escaped me over the years that I don't know, but as far as I know, there was no rapes and no crimes in the snowy, you know. Just ever think about it for, for one second, ever think about 25, 30 years project, thousands and thousands of men from any par every, every part of the world working together with a different culture, different language, and hardly anything ever, ever happened. I think it only highlights the absolute waste and stupidity of war when using exactly the same people that we were fighting against so bitterly only a few years before, we built something out here in Australia that was of great benefit to, to all Australians, and it was done with a great deal of pride by the same people that we were fighting against. The spirit of hope and the high morale were in full view at Happy Jack's. This settlement alone had 30 babies born to its 80 families, all in one year. I don't think anybody ever locked their house up. 
And of course, if we felt so secure, we'd leave the, all the kids to bed and go and play cards or whatever with our friends, and then they would nominate somebody to go around all their homes and check on the kids. And the ones checking would be, you'd be checking on German family or Dutch family, Italian family. It was that sort of community. There was so much going on. And we were so proud. It was We were working this, on the scheme too. We'd go down with uh, down to with the husbands on the Sunday to see the children, everyone to see how how the dam was progressing or the tunnel. And of course, there was the children were as interested in that as so. That was another thing. You know, they talked about the children talked about what their dads did. They were so proud of their dads. <laughs> why this day was so special for the snowy scheme and in fact for the whole of Australia? I've been told that I'm to move a switch here and as usual when I move a switch nothing happens for a little while. It takes apparently a couple of minutes for the turbines to warm up to their work and so I shall move the switch and then we'll wait to see whether it really is beginning. The scheme was now a political cause worth supporting. As Mr. Hope pulled the switch, one of the ten ninety five was opened by Dame Patty Menton, by the Governor General, His Excellency, the Right Honourable Sir Paul Hastin, Councillor Leo Barry, OBE, by National Development Minister David Fairbairn. Mr. Menzies says the operation of T2 is a historic event in the snowy scheme to provide power for cities and water for the country. One of the great logistic challenges came when two country towns had to be uprooted and moved to new locations. The decision made, planning began. The town plan was discussed and approved by the Snowy River Shire Council. Situated on the newly made Snowy Mountains Highway, the proposals for the new township of Adaminibe were based on the best town planning principles. The valley of old Adaminibe became Lake Eukambeen. It was filled with reserve water nine times the volume of Sydney Harbour. Bridges to old townships were blown up leaving behind a whole way of life and some bewildered residents. Progress is not without sacrifice. And the younger citizens all decided to be removalists when they grew up. Along the way, the Australian construction industry came into its own. Large-scale contract labour was a novel idea, but the scheme proved it could work here. It's now used on every building site in the country. Today's Australian construction giants got their start on the scheme. Hume built and installed gigantic pressure pipes for the scheme's aqueducts. Not exactly the Overland Express, but just the thing for shipping heavy pipes up a 30-degree incline, as we had to do later. 